Right. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, as, uh, as, as was said, um, currently, obviously, project management consultancy, but we've also developed uh, a software application which uses the, the logic uh, from our project management consultancy. So we're, uh, we're also operating in the uh, tech startup space. Uh, and if you want to learn more about it, there's websites and, and that you can go look at today. Uh, I want to just see if we can, somebody here in this room can take a bit of value from this presentation um, and, 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 and learn something new, hopefully. Um, we're not unique. Um, who here has ever been sick? You go to a GP um, and they ask you your allergies. Uh, but they don't record it. They don't write it down. Um, and it's not shared. Uh, that's the biggest issue. So when you go to a GP in Tipperary and you go to a GP in Dublin, the guy in Dublin doesn't know your data and you have to refill out that data. So it's the dreaded silos. So we're not unique. It's kind of familiar, isn't it? Um, and again, the healthcare system has a plan. Or like us all, we all have a plan. Um, and they're looking to digitalize the, the industry uh, by giving us promises and, and acronyms. Uh, UHI is unique, health uh, care identifiers, uh, and electronic health records. Again, it's all very familiar. Wrote a, a blog a couple of months ago, and we got a bit of heat for it. Um, but we, we said, look, if you don't want to read it, don't read it, if you don't like to know the truth. But um, what is the barrier these days to digitalization? Uh, is it culture? Is it uh, skills shortage? No, it's, it's money, it's cost, it's, it's contracts. Um, so, again, it's, it's, it's fairly familiar, is, is that's what's stopping the, the healthcare industry from, from, from driving this plan from 2030 to bring it down to maybe in the next couple of years. So we kind of look back and we reflect, and kind of the idea of this presentation was, let's bring this right back to basics. We've all been on this BIM wave for the last six, seven years now. Gave this presentation, a presentation here at the gathering in, in Dublin, actually, in 2013, and we spoke about standards you know, the BEP, uh, the, the model production delivery tables, all the rest, all these acronyms. And I suppose today I think we should just maybe forget about them, look past all of those acronyms, look past the standards, right? Imagine for, for a while if you can, if you can, if you can follow me. Um, and go back to the basics, go back to doing what we do best, yeah, which is project managing projects, builders. No matter what vertical you're in in this industry, every one of us in here is a builder. You know, that's our, that's our aim. So to, to narrate this and, and bring you through, I've decided to maybe give you a kind of a case study and tell you a little story. Um, so this is Alan. It's not Alan Hoare, it's another Alan, but <laughs> it's the reason for his name. Um, and Alan's going to help us project manage uh, the following case study. Um, and, and hopefully uh, it'll give you an insight to, to what can be achieved. So because... Alan uh, isn't bound by any contractual documentation. Uh, he can get involved early uh, in the design. Uh, and because the design team are precious and they don't ignore him, they take in his, uh, what he has to say, his lessons learned, etc. Uh, where egos are essentially left at the door. It's really, really important. Alan's collaborative. Um, so Alan sets up a plan. Uh, he sets up his project. He uh, puts out his teams and he sets up, let's start with civils because if we go into the detail here, I'm going to try and stay as high level as I can. And he sets his plan, he puts a roadmap in place. He gets his team involved, assigns them to the jobs, and everyone's ready to go. What Alan will then do is do the same process with all the other disciplines, structural, design, MEP, electrical, whatever. And then Alan will start putting a plan together to project manage out the design. So first on his list is lessons learned. So he finds a little gap, a little window there during early stage schematic design that he says, right, we've 14 days, let's get in and let's look at some lessons learned in this project. It's all about data. Everyone said it, Jerry said it. It's all about data, 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 data. So because Alan's a smart guy, in his head for now, he has a database of knowledge of lessons learned from previous projects. So imagine this is possible. Alan types in his type of project and he starts finding lessons learned that would have occurred on previous jobs. It's data, it's all there. We actually are already collecting that, and you're, you are right, 1%, if even we are using. 
And Alan goes down through these lessons learned that he has in his database to this particular project. And he identifies the ones that might be of use, that might save the design prior to going to, to construction, reducing cost and program, reducing risk uh, on the project. Alan start, is starting to show his value here. And data is obviously the new oil these days, so just as well we're building a lot of data centers. So again, going into the, into the detail a little bit, but just having that database, depending on the project type, to actually go down through and find issues that would have occurred in previous jobs and ensure that we don't mess it up again. Because most of these lessons learned, they occur because we've messed it up in the past. And again, these numbers are indicative, but you get to start seeing the value, the real value, because everyone wants to see numbers, don't they? Everyone wants to see ROIs, and, and they are there if you really put your mind to it. So once he's the lessons learned, done, he's, he's up and running, he's going to move on a little bit, and he gets into design coordination. And this is really important, and if this is set up correctly, it's, it's probably one of the most important uh, processes to set up uh, is to get involved in design coordination. And again, Alan goes into his issue tracker, types in his, his project type, and similarly, he sets out his, his issues on, on, on a project. Again, these would be from lessons learned, risk registers, uh, and, and so on. But the whole point, again, is to go down through it, collect the data that we already have, and show your value. Doing this, getting this design coordination, it's not only important for design. A lot of people forget the, the crossover between design and construction, but doing this coordination can kind of step the sequence of, of, of your program, of your schedule, to ensure that early stage um, packages need to be onboarded, uh, something that sometimes isn't thought about. And we're immediately fighting a losing battle when you get into the, the construction phase of a project, which is losing the client uh, time and money. He's up and running now, he's flying. Uh, so now he gets into DFMA if he's let. And it's the same process again and again. He types in his, his data center, his type of project. He sees the value in, 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 in modularization. Um, I mean, we all see the value in modularization. There's, uh, I've seen a company set up a, a factory down in my neck of the woods near Limerick. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it in the, in, in the news or in the media, but um, they're, they're doing super work and it's, it's, it's really here, modularization. Um, and this is just an example, of, again, with the civils package, you've got your precast. Do you know what improves? It, it, it improves the program, subsequently improves the, 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 the cost, uh, and it's even uh, beneficial for health and safety. Less labor, uh, less chance of, of, of getting hurt in sight. And again, you're just starting to show value of, of, of bringing in these, these, these uh, uh, processes, these, these ideas at early stage design. So now, probably one of the most important is, is the risk register. I think it's mad that coming from a BIM, BIM manager's background, and, and but again, why we always say go back to the basics, go back to doing what you do well, project manager job, you're not just a BIM manager anymore. You, know? you were a BIM manager five and six years ago when we took five days to federate a model and you know, six days to clash it and send it out and it was already six days out of date. You know, it's moved on, the BIM manager role has moved on, you're now I think it will go back to just being the, the traditional project management, design management, that vertical. Okay, and that's kind of the, the point here. Honestly, ask yourself, if you are in this position, how often do you talk about risk? Um, either uh, risk management or, more importantly, risk uh, mitigation. And it's the same, and if you're doing all the previous processes and steps correctly, you'll find that you've probably already these captured either in lessons learned or, or, or in the coordination sequence. And I have hundreds and hundreds of examples, but a simple one would be if you get in early, fly a drone over your site, do a topo survey. Uh, you would be surprised on, on the benefit that that might have. Maybe not so much in the design phase, but it would have a huge benefit for early stage uh, logistics uh, and mobilization on, on, on a project. So just kind of using that data, that information, we have tons of it. There's Excel files everywhere. That's the problem. They're siloed. They're, they're, different uh, disciplines within one project could be collecting the exact same data. I've actually seen it. Uh, commercial teams, uh, six of them would be filling out the exact same information uh, on separate Excels, which is madness. So it's just trying to get everybody to, to open up a little bit. And it's the same steps, showing the value that, that you can bring by, by reducing the risk, by reducing the cost, by reducing the, the impact on the schedule. 
uh, reducing RFIs, reducing variations on, on a project. And then the design validation. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's, it's the, there's an extension of time on this, on this program, but it's, it's there for a reason. Um, what we've probably witnessed in the last five or six years is there's a huge rush to hand over a design from, from design phase to, to construction, and there's no real time there to actually validate it and go through it and make sure that it's uh, up to the right spec and standard. Uh, and again, if you leave your egos at the door, it's actually, it might look like people air dirty laundry, but they're not. They're actually trying to reduce that impact on the cost, reduce potential variations that are going to come down the line. Um, and it's something that we probably all need to consider as an industry, both in design and from the, the contractor side, because they kill each other, don't they? Um, but I think we enjoy it as well. So, um, But the exact same, like, again, if you've done your risk registers, if you've done your uh, coordination sequence of DFMA, your lessons learned, this should all start reducing these numbers. But it's, it's just making sure that you're making simple checks. Like, you'd be surprised the amount of information that you would find on a specification and how it differs from what's on a model. Um, what's the point of being if, if your model doesn't represent exactly what's in your spec, what exactly is in your te technical drawings? There's no point. It's absolutely a waste of money. Um, so just having that time to, to, to go through, because I used to kill designers, but I actually feel for them. I see the, the time scale that, that they operate under. Um, and and it's, it isn't fair to a lot of the stage. What, what is fair these days? But, having that ability to go in and, and, and validate it and let designers design within their program and then have a, a phase there to actually validate it. And again, there could be huge savings in this if we actually just rewrote a contract to allow us to be able to do this. And as I said, it's, it's, it's one discipline that has just gone through the, the civils uh, design uh, and civils discipline, but you could do this right across all the different disciplines and, and, and program it out. Uh, but having that plan, having that information, having that data, and having it all connected is so important to actually project managing this job. And then, let's say Alan did a great job. Everything's going rosy so far. And Alan's now been asked to, to project manage the construction phase. Ideal. Uh, he's laughing now. He's, 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 he's up and running. Um, again, Alan was set up, and just the same way as he project managed the, the, the design discipline, he's going to project manage the construction, so break it out into disciplines. And Alan's going to slow down for a second, um, because I'm really pulling at your imagination strings here. But just simple logic and, and things to be aware of when you are project managing a job in terms of BIM, right? I, I will always say project management, I don't really refer to BIM anymore, um, because it's just a tool to project manage a job. But, he instead of he could be very lazy, Alan. He could just set up a few clash tests and reports and issue out a report weekly. And in this case, there's only 435 just uh, issues on the project, not to boggle the mind. But in real life, 14,000, 15,000 isn't a, a figure that would uh, be be unrealistic on some projects. What use is that? What, literally, what use is sending a report once a week with 15,000 clashes? It's not worth a damn, to be honest. Um, so. If Alan can offer his logic and his, his, his experience uh, in terms of project management, he actually starts to identify the sequence of build. So he relaxes for a minute, doesn't think about the model, and he identifies, right, what's my, what's my sequence of build? Am I building left to right, north to south? Uh, what's my crew size, my logistics? Um, and, and starts to consider all of these. And then what's my critical path? What's my install on, uh, on site date? So giving you an example, area one here on this site, this is our office. We work by the way, just, just if you're asking. Um, so install on site might be the 13th uh, of, of January uh, for precast, let's say, which has a lead time of about 12 weeks. Um, Alan having the, the, the common sense to identify what that actually means to the coordination, to the actual, to the, to the model, go right back, forget it, even go back for previous to, to the drawings. So you have your 12 week lead time. You would have I don't know, typically 15 days, include a negative approval process in case you've got a negative uh, comments back on your drawings, and include time there to actually generate the drawings from the model, because sometimes there needs to be time to, to do that. So you're building in a kind of a logic and a sequence into actually delivering your drawings, but you're going back further. You're actually going to freeze the model before you issue your drawings. So you're, you're just putting a, a roadmap, a plan in place. Otherwise, it just becomes chaotic. 
And it's really important to stick to this plan. And then you would have a stacked coordination sequence, which I'll get onto on the next slide, and the, the importance of that. Um, it's a bit exaggerated, but in area A1, instead of issuing a report with 14,000 tashes every week, you might just go, well, do you know what? In area A1, you've, you've only got a certain amount of tashes. And you would run this all the way through. So you'd sequence out your project, the way they're going to build it, the way they're going to install the precast in this instance, and you'd assign dates for every one of them. So I'm actually needing to worry about uh, area A1 back in August, not in January. You know, so we need to be thinking about it that far back if you have long lead time items like precast. And then, now get into the model. Now generate a clash report that breaks that model into these areas. Because now instead of giving someone a report with 14,000 clashes, you're saying, look, you have 14, but don't worry about them. You've got whatever it is, 26 in area A1 that needs to be resolved by in two weeks. Let's, let's get on that. And now you're giving value to a project manager or, or anyone on your site, your engineers, your, your, your site uh, foreman. You're giving them value. You're giving them something that they can actually relate to. Because they can't relate. A lot of them are, are afraid to relate to, 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 to digitalization in, in this industry. But if you give them something that they understand, they'll start playing ball. And this step coordination sequence, take area A as, 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 as an example. Our deadline is, is the 29th of August. Um, and we've got 26 issues in it, so let's, let's actually close them out. And again, it, you could be at fault by just saying, right, off you go, uh, different disciplines, go, go, go sort it out, and I'll come and check it before the deadline and make sure it's done. You actually need to hold our hands sometimes. So as you build a project, you build typically from the top down. So I take a data center as an example here. You put in your high-level services, your, your sprinkler systems, you put in your duct work, your duct drops, you put in your sealing grid, your hot oil containment, and you didn't finish with your, your racks and your servers. But actually, the most important um, object there is the object that goes in at the very end. It's, it's your racks and servers, because if they move even 20 mil, then the XYZ set out coordinates of the hot oil containment, which is to the mil, face, uh, with a Z bracket to the, to the racks, will move 20 mil, which will then affect the entire ceiling grid to move 20 mil, which will affect all your services, your lighting, your containment, everything. So that understanding that coordination sequence and the difference between the build sequence that now allows you to actually project manage closing out those 26 issues. Because instead of allowing them all a free-for-all to go figure it all out, what you'll find is on the 11th hour, one of them will have it right, and all the rest of them will, 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 will be following. But having this step process, you could actually work a date for each of those disciplines. You could give a date back from the 29th or, or, or forward in this case to the, each package, to the mechanical guys, the, the electrical guys, the, the fit-out give them all the data that they have to drop their pens, essentially, in the digital world. And then, yeah, we can talk about the cool tools that are out there, uh, VR and everything else. As long as you have a reason to use it, I always say this, it, otherwise, don't use it. Like, don't use it because it's cool. Use it if it brings value to, to, to your process. And VR, for a long time, I wasn't a fan of. I thought it was a gimmick. It kind of still is um, in some places, but there is a value in it if you put it into a process um, to, to, to make a savings, reduce risk. So I can give you 100 examples, but being able to go in, in that sequence of program before we cut the drawings and go into the room or the area that we've just signed off in the model, and prior to going cutting all our drawings and our sheets and issuing them for approval, let the client in, let us in ourselves and, and, and review it, check for access and maintenance, check for plant removal strategies, all, all, of, all of these buzzwords. But get in there and actually feel it, and you'd be surprised the amount of what some people think are silly questions, they're actually so valid, they're really, really, there is no silly questions in, in this process. But being able to get in and, and, and identify this early using VR, you know, now there's value. Um, and in theory, it should reduce the amount of uh, negative approval cycles on, on, on the draw, drawing approval process. Locking down that area, then issuing out the drawings, uh, and using the likes of VR and, and all the rest that we've gone through. The logic is probably the most important thing, project managing the job. Data, data, data. Um, so again, it's the same process. We could toggle on all the different disciplines and, and look at them all, and it might get a bit complex, but you, the, the power of this and having this information and this data is it's live uh, and you're starting to put accountability on, on, on the project and on, on, the, on your teams, you know, putting time frames on, on when it needs to be done and 
you know, just having that, that communications and, and, and the ability to, to, to converse uh, when you have problems and you have blockers. Um, I don't know if, if, if you've read the Toyota way, but I suggest that if you haven't, that you do. Um, because this is a simple and on system, it's a visual tool to allow us to better project manage our jobs. And this is all possible, it's all there. We can, we can now get into the, to, to the detail of seeing where our, our teams are, see, seeing where they'll cross over, the, log, the logistics of their build. Like all this information is power, all this information will allow us to project manage our jobs better um, and reduce the risk. Remember this guy? So now it's Alan. So Alan, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Alan can do this. I think you can see where I'm going with this, but Alan isn't a person. Alan is, or can be, a bot. He can take all of this information, all of this data, and alleviate even the project managers from having to think about all this knowledge, having to have all of this in their heads. Everyone's different. Everyone's going to have a different uh, opinion and a different uh, problem that they've faced in the past. But having that knowledge in a database, imagine the power of that. That would allow you, as an individual, to become that more, sorry, I'll speak back, to be more of that T-shaped, uh, kind of well-rounded, focused person. It allows you to expand your knowledge base uh, and not be the BIM manager who spent six days federating a model and running clash tests. You can now actually get into understanding project management, get into the commercials, get into all the rest of the stuff that you should be involved in uh, on, on a project. Short and quick, but uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.